Welcome to the MMHP in the 989. Podcasting from the Michigan Rock Legends Hall of Fame in downtown Bay City. Channeling all styles and eras of Michigan music history from, from the, the city, city by, by the Bay. Bay. And now, Dr. J, Sir Fred, Mr. Mike, and your host, Scott Baker. Collectively, we've known each other for about 150 years. <laughs> Michigan. All right. It's been a while. All right. I first came to Michigan. Um, actually, the first time I came, yeah, uh, I, I was living in Detroit. Uh, I was living in Chicago, and I moved to Detroit in the in the turn of the year in 1967. Living in Chicago. I had a chance to live down the street from Loring Janes. Do you remember Loring Janes? Mm -hmm. No. Loring Janes ended up in Kalamazoo, but he was part of the crowd that included a man named Gypsy, Rowena, Rick Ruskin. You probably yeah, I heard know of him. who Rick Ruskin is. Uh, and. Uh, uh, a late arrival to that crowd was Jim Perkins, um, Finvara's Ren. Hmm. Jim Perkins, 
We'll see, there's a, there's Jim, a, Jim, Jim, Jim a singer Perkins. in Saginaw by the name of Jim Perkins, who's yeah. very um, well-known. Jim, now, this Jim lives in Detroit, I think. Right. And he, and he, and he, he plays, still is. Uh, he plays Irish music, and his daughter plays fiddle, and his wife plays something, something, you know, and then they have an Irish family band. But, uh, and they were a whole gang of people. I mean, uh, Detroit had a very healthy folk scene back in the 60s. Um, one, of the, one of the aspects of that folk scene was a club, uh, I was never there, so this is all folklore, right? This is all oral history that they told to me. Uh, there was a club called The Retort that was run by a fellow named Peter Cantini. Do you remember the retort? Mm -hmm. um, it was run in the basement of a brothel. <laughs> and oh. the madam was the club owner's mother. And he had, among other people, Reverend Gary Davis, Doc Watson, and Jesse Lone Cat Fuller <laughs> play in his basement. And when Jesse Fuller came, the person assigned, the person that the community kind of assigned to be his, you know, handler while he was in the community, uh, was Paul something. He ended up in California. But when Jesse pulled up in his Chevrolet, which had the guitar and the foot della and uh, a suitcase and a little bed for him to sleep in in the back. That's how Jesse traveled. And he pulled his equipment out and he set it up and then they went to dinner and they came back. Jesse had the world's only Larson Brothers made 12 spring. It was a huge like two feet across the back, 12 string. And it had this great big baseball bat of a neck on it. 12 string. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nobody ever saw it. And it had the Prairie State Bar, you know. I mean, there were a couple of other guitars that were made with bars in them, but that was recognizable. It came back, it was gone. Oh. Jesse didn't miss a beat. Take me to Sears. They went to Sears. He paid cash for an electric. Uh, Harmony? It was, what was it? it Silvertone? That, that, that Stella. Stella, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Stella, yeah. An mm -hmm. electric Stella 12 string, which he kept for the rest of his life and was filmed with several times. But uh, there are also films of him playing that great big Stella. I mean, for the the great big prairie state. Wow. Uh, <laughs> this is a prairie state. Yeah, your guitar is? Larson, brother. Yeah. Larson. Yeah. What year? Yeah. I have no idea what year it was. This, is, this, was, this one is 1937. That's what I meant, that year is yeah. 37, okay. Uh, it's coming on 100 here. It's a, it's a nice guitar. This is a wonderfully playable guitar. It sounds amazing when uh, you sort of play it. So are you originally from Michigan or no? I'm sorry? You're not originally from Michigan then? I'm not originally from Michigan. I'm originally from Massachusetts. I moved in here in 1968. Um, and I lived in Detroit for about a year and a half, two years. I moved. My wife and I broke up. I moved to Ann Arbor. I the, was in Ann Arbor the, for the about six or seven months. Yep. He's He rescued me. He brought me to... <laughs> he found me playing on the Diag. <laughs> or somewhere. Okay. He, he's, walking, the he, he's got his fiddle. He's walking. He's like, let's, let's play some music. Come back to my door. I stayed, oh. I stayed, oh, I stayed in the... Did he squad for six months? Yeah. Wow. Wow. And Those were the days. I had an empty room. My roommate left. And there's an empty bed. I said, Cohen, yeah. you take it. So, wow. wow. 
Well, here we are in the MMHP and the 989. We're already into the podcast and the stories are already flowing. Uh, uh, we got a special edition here coming out of the Dunlop Pontiac showroom. Uh, uh, Dr. J is uh, on vacation for this one. However, uh, Mr. Mike and uh, Sir Fred and myself are here. Um, the one and only, and uh, he's kind of got the keys to Michigan like Alice Cooper or uh, Dick Wagner or any of them from out of town that they kind of made Michigan their home. But Mr. Andy Cohen's in the house. How you doing, Andy? Uh, is any better? I'd be in handcuffs. <laughs> All right. That's that's how we're kind of going to start the show. <laughs> he brought his friend Andy Rogers back. How are you doing, Andrew? Good, sir. Good. And Andrew's at his own podcast. And please go back and check Andrew's out. Uh, he's got a fantastic show of his own that we've had George, a two-part series on. George Herder. With George Herder. Yes, indeed. But uh, Andy Cohen's in, and he's also going to be our first performance, our first show that we've booked here in the showroom. Uh, House Half Mile took it over last year. Mike, Mr. Mike uh, has the keys to this operation, and um, we're going to do this special podcast down here. So keep rolling out these stories, Andy. What, what, what do you oh, got for us here? I can keep going. Well, you were moved into Ann Arbor in 68, 67? Well, yeah, 69. All right. I moved here. Well, you came from Detroit to Ann Arbor? I was here through 68 here in Detroit. Mm -hmm. That's when I met Rick Ruskin. Uh, Rick Ruskin was is several years younger than me. Uh, uh, if, inshallah, I will be 77 in a week. Uh, uh, at that time, uh, this was 50 some, 50 some years ago already. I look back at my own life and I tell, my, I tell myself I'm history. But we all are. We all are. Yeah. The question is, did we waste that time? And I don't think we did. I mean, it might have looked like it at the time. <laughs> but I think a bunch of us gained some insight and deepened our acquaintanceship, not just with old culture, but with how to maintain it, how to be part of it. Uh, my dad was a labor lawyer. He was the union lawyer. He was the one that negotiated with management. And he had to think not just about the guys on the board or, you know, the, uh, the leadership of the union. He had to think about all of those workers in the meat packing plants that he uh, that you know, they call them baloney benders. I worked as a baloney bender just before I went to college. Mm. My dad wanted to know what wanted my brother and me to know what real work was like, so that we would be motivated to study. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work, but it was a good try. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, that, that, that time was interesting. Since that time, I've had any number of jobs, but I always figured, um, particularly with the blind guys, but all of the old blues men that were still around them. Um, in Chicago, there were Jim Brewer and Arvella Gray and Maxwell Street Jimmy and and a lot of people that you never heard of, Robert Nighthawk, uh, he was playing down on Maxwell Street, and there were a number of gospel acts playing down on Maxwell Street. You could tell they were gospel singers because when they hopped around, danced around, they never crossed their feet. They crossed their feet, it would be dancing. And that's not allowable. Truth. Yeah, it's solid. You, know, you can see it in the in the that uh, there Jim there's a Jim Brewer group, gospel group that played on Fridays in Maxwell Street. Jim actually uh, Jim had uh, had had one eye removed when he was a kid. That's what they used to do. If the eye bothered the kid at all, they'd take it out. So 
his other eye, he had a tiny little hole in a cloudy patch through his iris so that he could see clearly through this one little hole with one eye. So his way of getting around the world was like that. At one point, we got him a 10 power telescope, and he played with that for a long time. He really liked that. <laughs> <coughs> that and wallets with chains on them so that nobody could take them away. He liked those things. But uh, he was married to a woman named Fanny, both of whose eyes had been removed from <laughs> childhood. Wow. And they were both born about, Jim was born in 1920, Fanny was about the same age. They were both children of the Great Migration. When Jim was 20 years old, he followed his family six months on to come to Chicago on the IC. But he was from Brookhaven, Mississippi. Uh, uh, where his, he said, he was often called Blind Jim Brewer, but he didn't like that. He said, my mother named me Jim. She didn't name me Blind. Hmm. I think that was the name of the album, wasn't it? Yeah. Blind Jim Brewer? That there was, I think there was a, uh, we called it, we just called it Jim Brewer, the Philo album. Philo. Yeah. Uh, he made one album on Philo, and then he made the next one called Tough Luck on Earwig. Oh, I didn't see that one. Yeah, you haven't seen that? Oh, that, yeah. I'll get you one of the CDs. Uh, I'll send yeah. you one. You just give me your address. Um, but we got a new Jim Brewer record coming out. Um, fella got hold of Michael Frank. Michael and I kind of co-managed Jim Brewer. You know, we both had a great affection for one. And now we're still working together 50 years later. Uh, I would be sunk if it wasn't for Michael Frank. Wow. This is from Michael Frank of Your Weird Records. There's a, a very good reason why he's gotten a couple of KBAs and a couple of Grammys. He's very assiduous. He's Excellent. And he believes, as I do, that the old men deserve to work. So he's helping me get work. That's awesome. <laughs> wow. wow. Very cool. <laughs> but somebody contacted him with an old tape of Jim Brewer. And I, I said to him, when was the tape made? And he says, it was made in Evanston in 1967. I said, grab it, grab it. Because in 1971, some SOB knocked on Jim's door. He was living down like, down on the 30 hundreds on the south side in a dump, him and Fanny. And some guy knocks on the door and says he's from the city. And he's checking for roaches. Do you have a hammer? Well, Jim was a tinkerer. He could tinker with all kinds of things despite having very limited vision. And uh, he had a hammer and he gives the guy the hammer. The guy turns around, whacks him on the head. Jim had a very hard head. He turned around, he took the hammer away from the guy. Uh, caused him to exit, <laughs> and then he was so. By that time, he was crying. He was mad. He was screaming, hot under the collar. He slammed the lid of the toolbox down on the little finger of his left hand and broke it. And of course, that redoubled everything. So finally, at length, he manages to get to the hospital. He gets to Billings, to ER. And the only thing they can do at that point is open it up and take out the bone and sew it back up. So Jim lost the bone on the end of his little left hand little finger that you have to use to make the long A. Mm -hmm. And forever after he had to make his long A like that. Yeah. And his B core was never right because there was just a flop of skin where yeah. his little finger used to be. But he could still play, he certainly could still pick. But in 1967, he was a four-finger picker, and man, he was hollering a $2 pistol. We're gonna bring that out. That's gonna be one of our River Lark records. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, uh, 
I was just happy to have a, a role. Jim was highly respected. He used to play, he used to back up people like Sonny Boy Williamson. And, you know, and people like Honey Boy Edwards totally respected him. He's really the guy that taught Arvella Gray how to play guitar when Arvella was, had the incident that made him blind. Uh, you know, he, he said he was all depressed and Jim pulled him out of it by yeah. teaching him how to play the guitar. Yeah. He said, you know, Arvella really wasn't hitting on nothing, but he could make a living. <laughs> Give him the tools he needed. Yeah. Arvella Gray would walk up and down in front of the Jazz Record Mart at 7 West Grand in Chicago playing John Henry all day, you know, <laughs> with a slide. There were other people. The story of Maxwell Street, which is where Jim mainly hang out, hung out, that's one end of a whole other story that um, unfolded between 19, about 10, but really kicking up in 1914, the day we entered World War I. The story of the Great Migration is not just black people, but white people too, coming north. They settled in different areas of the same cities. But there was a whole hillbilly section of Chicago, you know, up around 5,800 there. Uh, you know, far away from the folks from Mississippi, but they each knew the other was there. And they were the same sort of people, a lot of them were white sharecroppers coming up from Arkansas. In 1914, when we entered World War I, we cut off European immigration instantaneously, literally overnight, so there was an instantaneous labor shortage that was filled by mainly sharecroppers coming north, straight north, on the IC or on the seaboard or on the New York Central, from wherever they were in the south, going as far north as they had money to get on the train and go. Jim's family did that in 1939, <clears throat> up till then. Jim's dad was a barber, and his mom was a church lady. Jim's dad wanted him, he also played, and taught him to play. Um, his dad wanted to teach him blues, which he did. Uh, his mom wanted him to sing gospel music. Jim said, it's okay, nobody was ever hurt by a song. I can do both. <laughs> And he did both. That actually stood him in very good stead because when he was working up on Maxwell Street and the University of Chicago students would come around, they'd invite him to go play for their coffee houses and the fraternities and stuff. That's how he got that permanent Wednesday job at the No Exit. You know. Oh. Uh, Jim's story is echoed a thousand times. I've, I've you know, every time I see an old blind guy on the street, <laughs> I go talk to him. There's another guy um, you might have heard of if you're deep into the blues man named uh, Will Dukes. You ever heard of Will Dukes? Yeah. Somebody told me that he was little Laura Dukes' brother. Hmm. You know, little Laura Dukes played with the Memphis Jug Band, the late edition of it. Dewey Corley, Will Bats, Will Shade, uh, Laura Dukes, who's the other guy, uh, um, Charlie Burks. They were all still, they were all still, these are the same play, these are those guys who taught Charlie Muscle White how to play. Okay. Do you still have your jug band? I know you had it for a while. Do I still have a jug band? Yeah. Oh, you mean the Florida Blues Band? Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We get called the 
we got called the Florida Blues Band because that was the only tune we knew at the time. <laughs> the, uh, this is 12 bar blues in C, in G, followed by 12 bar blues in C, followed by a transition back to G uh, through an A flat chord. I'll follow you. You'll follow me. This is this is the Florida Blues. This is the the, the number that we named our band after. That's the Florida Blues. Nice Thank changes. You. Yeah. Uh, erstwhile partners in crime here, yes. Fred Reef and Andy Rogers. And incredible. What, what kind of guitar is that again? This hey. is a euphonon. 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 E U P A T N O M. You said a 37 euphonon? The 1937 euphonon. Name involved Larson. So yeah, it's one of the Larson products. Okay. When they start, I think. Um, don't quote me on this, but I think that they made 12 fret guitars for the longest time. They they bought. They went to work. They were 
like Norwegian cabinet makers trained. <coughs> they came to this country and they started working for a guy named Maurer, who made the Maurer guitar. They bought the company from him when he got too old to work anymore. Yeah. And then they made guitars under a brace of different names. They continued making the Maurers. They made um, harp guitars. They made harp ukuleles and harp mandolins. Some of them were very fancy. They made any number of Tree of Life guitars. They also made lots of student model guitars for Stetson, Stahl, um, Dyer. They even made a few guitars for Martin. And where were they located? Hmm? Where, where were they located? They were located um, somewhere south of the Loop in Chicago. Oh, Chicago. Okay. Um, their building was um, this is located in kind of a down neighborhood, and uh, in order to get into the building, they had to pull a string that would lift a latch on the bottom floor. They were on the second floor. <laughs> so you had to walk up a set of stairs to the shop. They had all the strings in there, and that's also where they made the guitars and the mandolins and everything. Uh, but they were... Uh, they made, a, if you look through old WLS catalogs, you know, the WLS barn dance, you'll see a lot of Larson guitars. A lot of Larson guitars. I just found one of those magazines. Now I got to look. Yeah. I uh, found an old WLS yeah. Yeah. program or whatever yeah. it is. I looked them up. They all, got, they, made they all got peg heads like this. They look like Gibsons. But they're fancier. They made guitars so fancy other like Mars names, including Stahl, Maurer, Stahl, Maurer, Prairie State, Dufanon, Dyer. Yeah. Bruno. Would I tell you a lie? You I'd eat chick fried chicken before I tell you a lie. Andy, th send, throw that to me, will you, buddy? He's hit a copy on that. I'd like to see that later tonight. Yeah. Thank you. That's fantastic. The tone is uh, so old, but at the same time, so present. It's just oh, Very yeah. unique sound. You know? yeah. That's been your baby for how long? Oh, just uh, this one's just about a couple of years. Oh, yeah? I've had several different Larsons, and my friend Loring, who was the one that uh, introduced me to Larsons, he had one. Uh, I always think of you with a Gibson J212. Like the, I, the, the, the I used to have a J200. 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 Yeah, a J200 Gibson. J200. But, uh... Uh... <laughs> Play. Yeah, you make you make it look. Yeah, good. yeah, totally. Well, it is easy to play. For one thing, it's it's the the neck is just wide enough, but not too wide. I had another one of these things with a two inch neck, and I was straining my thumb trying to get my thumb over the over the, over on my hook cords, you know. Um, but this one is just I don't know. There's something magic about it. Where'd you find it's that? It's very one? unpretentious. I like it. I like it because I like it because it's very plain. It doesn't have a lot of a lot of bells and whistles. Know. It's got yeah, yeah. It, where did you come across that? A friend of mine bought it. I don't know where he got it, but mm -hmm. I think this one passed through Tony Klassen's shop, and that's probably why it plays so good. Because I suspect that Tony Tony Klassen was Arc New Era guitars. 
and he could duplicate quite literally any guitar or you could make up a guitar and say I want one with inlay like this and a top like that and a back like that mm -hmm. and he'd make it for you. you know sweet and but uh, let's let's let me step back and ask you where where sure. did your uh, musical heritage start where did where did, when did you become interested in playing music and what well, age about 3 3 Guitar, my, my, yeah, the bat? Yeah, my, my, when my daddy wanted me to go to sleep, he, he'd smoke a ciggy with me in bed. You're three year old, you're puffing with you know, your dad? And, and sing me about the foggy <laughs> do. And he'd, he'd, he'd sing me about the foggy do. And, and um, uh, you know, different folk songs. So I grew up with that, you know. When the folk revival came, I already knew all those songs, so I went straight from folk songs to Dixie to Tom Lehrer, to Dixieland jazz, to the blues. When I was in high school, uh, Miss Clark, the librarian, noticed that I used to go listen. I, I got on the honor roll one time. When you get on the honor roll at Sharon High. You could leave study hall and go listen to records. Oh. So I used to go listen to records. But instead of listening to pop tunes, I listened to these creaky old folk songs. And Miss Clark noticed that she gave me, you know, that uh, Sonny Terry, Barney McGee, Big Bill Brunsey being interviewed by Studs Terkel. They made it on WFMT in 1957. And this was about, I think, 1960 or so. And it hadn't come out that it came into the library. She handed it to me, and my life changed. Wow. I got the mopper's blue. I got the mopper's blue. Soaking water in my shoes. I got the mopper's blue. I'm the happiest man in town. Ain't got no gal. Ain't got no gal. Some big fat man. Driving a Cadillac car. Smoking a big cigar, come along and took my gal. I ain't got no gal. I got my most blue, the happiest man in town. Walking on down the road. 
Mind my own business. I wasn't bothering the soul. Looked up in the third story window. What do you think I did? Behold, there was a man there. He was throwing out all his clothes. And I looked up and I said, Hey, bud, how come you're throwing out your dozen? He looked down at me. He listened. And listen here, fella. If you knew I was behind this window and when I was paying for it, you'd know that by the time I got down from here, these clothes be out of style. I got the Marbles Blues, I'm the happiest man in town. I can't remember when I've been so happy. Oh. Yeah. Unreal. That was on that <coughs> release. That, yeah. Oh. That your teacher in third grade? Third grade, was it? No, this is, this is about 10th grade. 10th grade, wonderful. Yeah, okay. and in th Chicago? When I was in third grade, no, sure. I wasn't. I was You're in Massachusetts. I was living in Massachusetts okay. then. Okay. A little suburb of Austin called Sharon. <clears throat> and um, uh, it had. Uh, I was glad I grew up in Sharon, you know, because if I'd grown up in the city, um, I'd be dead by now. You know, I'd have gone into much more trouble much earlier. I got into enough trouble as it was. Uh, How did you, when I saw you one time, you brought us into Kent State? Uh-huh. Yeah. What year was that? I can't remember. At that point, Well, I it had to be 86 or 87, something like that. Before yeah. that, I think. Yeah, what at that it? point, I was in graduate school, and I had located all kinds of sources of income. I was I had located all kinds of little <laughs> funds here and there that I could tap into to bring my friends in. So I got a call from Freddie and he says, I'm traveling with lazy laughter. Can you get me some kind of gig? And I scored five hundred bucks. I don't know how I've I've Forget how I got it. We just gave it all to Lester, and, you know. And then uh, I had Dave Robinson from the Numbers Band playing, Jack, playing uh, 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 drums, and I played guitar. And Jack D'Alessandro is playing bass, and Freddie's playing, Freddie's playing the washboard, and 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 uh, and Lester kept turning to me because <laughs> I was playing too much, and he said. He looks Jimmy at me. Reed, Jimmy yeah. Reed, yeah. Jimmy Reed, Jimmy Reed, Jimmy Reed. He wanted to go. Yeah, that's all he wanted. <laughs> Didn't want nothing but that. Right. I said, just, just leave that white boy stuff alone. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't I bring Dr. Ross in one time too? Yes, you did. Um, uh, we had him for the folk festival. Right. Because yeah. that was earlier. Yeah, than I remember, and we played Cat Squirrel. At the folk festival, right? Yeah, I mean, he tore it up. Now, the thing I always like to point out about Doctor Ross is that he worked in the same building as Wade Maynard. You know, really, Wade Maynard? Yeah, the Wade, I mean, the same yeah. plant in Flint. Yeah, he Wade died. Maynard. He died right on the floor of the plant. Doctor no Ross did. He had a heart attack. He kept telling me, "I'm going to retire. I'm going to retire," and he never did. So when he was 65 or 66, Dr. Roth, he had a heart attack right on oh, the floor man. and died. Oh, I'm so sorry. And Wade well, Maynard, that was a, in the early 90s or something. Yeah, Wade right. Maynard lived to be in, in, in Dr. Right. Now, Dr. Ross was another anomaly. I have two lefty players in, in my Riverlark catalog. They, they restring the guitar, so they're playing chords that are mirror images to my chords. He also played, the, I heard, the harmonica yeah. upside down. Well, well, he wasn't a restringer. He just turned the guitar upside down and played it backwards. Like Jimmy. Oh, he did. Yeah, like Elizabeth Cotton <laughs> yeah. or Bill Staines or, or uh, Albert King. Mm -hmm. Albert King, yeah. See, there's a difference. There's restringers and then there's upside downers. And he was an upside downer. I remember that about him. Now, you just mentioned your record label, Revelark. Your record label, Revelark? Sure. It's called River Lark. River Lark. Um, my late wife started it. Her name was Larkin Bryant. And uh, I'm just trying to carry on. And What year did you start the label? Um, well, 
her label was a DBA and it passed with her, so I just kept the name and incorporated and I have a bunch of people who should have been recorded a long time ago, but they weren't, so I did it. Um, I got this Jim Brewer issue mm -hmm. uh, with Jim in his prime. He was a hotter than a $2 pistol, man. He was great. Um, and a younger man, 48, named Dee Robinson, whose family goes back to Clarksdale in the 1890s. And that's how he got his music. He likes this Elizabeth Cotton, Netta Baker kind of Piedmont style blues too. And he's living in Decatur. I'm gonna bring bringing him up to uh, to a couple of gigs around Illinois and Wisconsin in the next couple of months. Um, and a country singer named Kurt Anderson that uh, he's just got a voice that'll tear your heart apart, you know. One of those baritone singers like Ernie, Ernest Tubb. Uh, uh, I got an R&B guy named Harry Orloff. Does all of his own producing. I got a 20-year-old lefty and a 62-year-old lefty. They're both restringing lefties. The older one is named Paul K. He played with Honey Boy Edwards for 20, for 20 years. And the younger one, he just turned 20. And he's playing stuff that's 100 years old. Hmm. You know, he's working his way through, through folklore collections and stuff. When he was six, uh, he started playing blues, encouraged by no less than Wolfman Belfort. You ever run into Wolfman Belfort? In Germany. In Dresden, Germany, Germany. Yeah. And He's from Hernando. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. Right. They were at this festival in Dresden, yeah. Germany. Yeah. So Roman yeah. Roman was getting up with with Wolfman when he was. I mean, Wolfman is about like sixty five, and 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 Roman was about six. <laughs> you know, he's been playing for that long, and he's just just a very sensitive player. He's a very good singer. I'm very proud of my artists. Um, what, do you, what year was the label start? Did you start the label? When, uh, yeah, I just started the label a couple of years ago. Okay. Um, Is there a website for this that people can go not to? Not yet. Um, there's only me to do everything. So I delegate everything I can, and I haven't found anybody that I can delegate making a website to. But mm -hmm. yet, I'll get to it. You know, I gotta get my taxes paid too. I gotta get my an accountant. I got you know, all kinds of stuff. What I do have is a lot of recordings, and some of them are historical recordings. Do you uh, have any of Howard Armstrong? Of Howard, Howard Armstrong? Arm I remember no. that time at the art when Andy well, and I sat in. Yeah. Um, I don't have any Howard Armstrong. I have five reels of. Houston Stackhouse. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, with a harmonica and drums. Houston Stackhouse is an iconic guitar player. There's this great picture that Chris Strackwitz took of the, um, what's the, the Helena, Arkansas band, Sonny Boy Williamson and Houston King Stackhouse. Biscuit. Yeah. Or and the drummer, whose name I always Peck. forget. His last so name was Peck. Yeah. Uh, the flower. Um, right. What's the name of the flower company? <laughs> uh, I have a blank right now. Yeah. We'll think of it in a minute. We're old. You know, we can be <laughs> forgiven for forgetting fact. Or Martha White. <laughs> Martha White. No. No, no, that's, that's no. Earl Scruggs. Sponsor. Right. This was a, a different flower. Right. The, the one with Sonny Boy Williamson on the on the flower mm. right. on the flower sack.
we used to do. Which, oh, which one? La Vence Joyeuse? That La Vence Joyeuse. Is that the one? Oh, God, I haven't played that in a while. Let's see if we can. You can play on this, too. It's just a waltz time. I'm... Played it so long, I don't feel we remember all the parts. Ready? Um, yes, this is this is um, uh, a waltz that Jean Carignan, who has been dead for forty years and is even Too dead, long. is still the best <laughs> fiddle player in Canada. <laughs> um, but he played with a man named Alain Ouellette. And they made several great records. This is this is on one of them. It's called La Valse Joyeuse, the happy the joyous waltz.
That was beautiful. Played a kind of a wild abandoned style that, that, that genre. That was beautiful. Yeah. You've been practicing. No, that's I played no fair. That, I played that in a while. <laughs> but that's how Jean Luc that's how he would he would play it. Jean Luc. He hit such a bowing arm that uh he played so strongly. He didn't care if he was his intonation got off a little bit. He just mm -hmm. kept going. He just kept yeah. going. And it, 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 it a remarkable bowing arm. He was a French, not a French, but a Canadian national treasure. Yeah. And a uh, taxi driver. And a taxi driver, yes. Yeah. His wife wouldn't let him be a professional musician full time. Jean Carignan was... Huh. Jean didn't Carignan. trust it. Well, you know, we were talking earlier about Mac McCormick. He was yeah. a cab driver, I guess. He was also a census taker. That's right. How, that's how a lot of how he, uh, you know, ended up knocking on people's front doors and talking to them. Wow. He must have been a charming rascal. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Right. And that wraps up part one with Andy Cohen and Andrew Rogers as we let the two old friends reconnect via music as well as stories. Uh, hearing Andy Cohen's stories and uh, backlog of history and his folklore knowledge has been a magical thing for the MMHP. Uh, a lot of old friends going back. And we get to have that also with Sir Fred sharing on the washboard and the music parts with him. Uh, Andy Cohen is going to share more stories and play more music as we get to, into part two coming up here in two weeks. And we hope that you hang in there with us. Uh, this is the day before our show at the Dunlop Sound Room in Bay City. And uh, we thank you all for tuning in and uh, getting to share these experiences with us. Hang in there for part two. We'll see you in two weeks. The MMHP is hosted on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and our own Libsyn podcast site. You can also search MMHP989 on Facebook for up-to-the-minute information, as well as both Dr. J and Sir Fred's album picks of the week, posted every weekend. Don't forget to look for Mr. Mike's local music live series, posted frequently on MMHP's Facebook hub, as well as Scott's Mid-Mitten 15 from Harvest Canteen, featuring one-on-one -on -one interviews with Michigan music artists. You can connect with Scott on the web at scottbakermusic.com, Dr. J at michiganrockandrolllegends.com, Sir Fred at fredreif.com, Mr. Mike at YouTube at MrBT1. That's M-R-B-T-E-E -E and the number one. Brought to you by Michigan Rock and Roll Legends, located both inside the Bay County Historical Museum on Washington Avenue, as well as Scotty's Sandbar on Evergreen Drive at the Bay City Middle Ground. On behalf of our hosts, Dr. J, Sir Fred, Mr. Mike, and myself, this podcast wouldn't have been here without the voice of the MMHP, Mr. Eddie Switek, the generosity of the Bay County Historical Museum, which hosts the Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame, as well as this podcast, Mr. Alan Garcia all of our guests and especially to the listeners we want to thank you 